Well, good morning, everybody. Everybody who's here, it's nice to see all of your faces. And it's such a beautiful day today, too, isn't it? It's great. It's great to see you guys. I'm going to open us up in prayer. If you wouldn't mind standing with us, we're going to worship God together today. Heavenly Father, we welcome you here. We thank you for this time where we just get to come together as your sons and, and as your daughters, God, just to glorify you, our Father, our Lord, our Savior, our Creator, God. And um, this morning we give you all the praise and all the glory that only you deserve. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church, and we need your power in us. We seek your kingdom first. We hunger and Columbus. 
We had a wonderful time. Our theme was abide, and I wanted to uh, share a verse with you today um, from John 15, where that theme was taken. I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We know that as we put deep roots into Christ, as we spend time in prayer, as we spend time in the word, that we are able to grow in Christ, and we're able to see fruits in our life, and we're able to see fruits in the lives of the people that we touch, our neighbors, our families, our friends. But today I wanna to celebrate that as we have abided as a church in Christ, like look around, I love the fruit that's here. I love all the people that are close to Jesus that are here to help us to celebrate today. I am so excited for all the lives that have been transformed, changed, people that have gotten deeper and closer to the Lord. And I'm excited for what's gonna happen in the future. All the new people that are gonna come in that we're gonna have as a chance as a family to impact, to be sister and brothers to, to see grow in Christ, come to Christ, and just what God is doing in our church. I'm just really grateful on our second birthday for all that God's doing as we abide in Him. And knowing that it's to Him all the glory, that nothing, none of this would have happened without Jesus. None of this would have happened without our great God doing the work here at our church. So thankful. Let's pray. Dear Father God, we give you all glory, Lord, for this celebration today, Lord. We are so grateful. We are so thankful for what you're doing in our lives. We are thankful for what you are doing in our church's life. We are thankful for how you're using us to produce fruit into this community, Lord. We are thankful for the people that are yet to come that are going to join us and be part of our family. We are thankful and grateful. Help us to always go to you, Lord, because we can't do anything without you. We need you desperately, Lord, for any good thing to come to us, for us to have the abundant life that you want us to have. Lord, help us to stay close to you, to depend on you, and we give you praise for what you're doing. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
your love.
out his son, not sparing, sent him to die. I scarce can take it in that on the cross. My God, we thank you. God, we celebrate today how great you are. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are a good God, the savior of the world, and you've come to be with us today. Lord, we pray 
that you would just fill our service in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Man, it's so good to be with you today. I want you, as you're seated, I want you to turn to somebody near you and just welcome them to church today, all right? Welcome to New Life Church. I don't know if you've noticed all the twos around, but we have a birthday to celebrate. Woo! Happy second birthday to us. We're so excited that you guys got to come and be part of our birthday celebration. Please take pictures, enjoy, come and stay after the service, enjoy a cupcake with us. We're going to be outside with the cupcakes this time. And we just want you to have time to fellowship and to celebrate all the cool things that God has done here over the last two years. We are just so thankful for Pastor Kerry and Pastor Eric accepting God's call, coming from Toledo, moving their precious family, and coming and investing in us. We are thankful for Trish and for Seth doing the same, coming all the way from California and coming investing in the kingdom and following the call and serving us. We are just thankful for all of you being part of our church family. We want to connect with you today. If this is your first time or if you've been with us, there are cards right in front of you in the seats, and we want to know more about you. We want to know how to pray with you. We want to um, get connected with you. And part of that is we want you to sign up for a life group. There are all kinds of sign-up sheets out in the hallway. If you want to know how to get connected to this church, how to meet people, how to be part of this church in an active way, we encourage you to be part of those life groups. We're about to start our White Church series, and we want you to be in one of those life groups and, and making friendships and being church family together and supporting each other in prayer and going into the Word together. We want you to be part of a life group. There's lots of other announcements here in the bulletin. I encourage you to look over those things and know all the other things that are coming up here, exciting stuff. <laughs> And we just want to thank you for your tithes and the offerings. Um, you can give at nlco.info forward slash give. There's also a box in the back. In the left, you can stick cash in there. You can put a check in there or whatever. And we will definitely still take that old school check. All right, let's pray together. Father God, you are so good, Lord. We are so thankful for all the blessings you've brought on this church, Lord. And we are thankful for the opportunity to be part of what you're doing here, to invest and give back to the amazing blessings you've given to us. Some of them financial, some of them family blessings, some of them good jobs, some of them just that we have health and that we're here. Safety, Lord, you have blessed us in different ways in many ways, Lord, and we are just thankful to be obedient and to be able to give back to what you've given to us, Lord. We are thankful for the opportunity to invest in the work that you are doing in this community and through this church and all the lives being transformed, Lord. We want to be part of that. We want to be faithful because you are so faithful to us. Thank you for this privilege and opportunity to tie back into what you're doing. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Man, I am excited to be here today. I feel like I say that every week and um, that's okay. Because honestly, I, I, you know, I, this isn't in notes or planned, but I, I said this for a service and it's really genuinely true. Like getting to do what I do and, and share God's word every week is really, it really truly is one of my favorite parts of the week. And people go, oh yeah, okay, sure. That sounds very, you know, not true. <laughs> But it is, it really is. I love, I love being able to do this. And, you know, thinking back over the last couple years, right, this, is, this has been 
just a crazy ride for the last couple years, uh, or the last two, specifically two, that we've been doing this, that we've, we've been able to do what God has called us. And, and I think back over uh, about three years ago, when, uh, when we first started having conversation about this, and, and to, be, <laughs> to be honest, I'm gonna tell you a story that is fun. Um, you know, our, our college, one of our college friends, had, Josh had reached out to us, and, and many of you probably know this story, but I think it's a fun thing to, to share every year at this time. Because, because God works like this. So, so our college friend Josh, he reached out to us and was like, hey, I, you know, we have a church that we're talking to uh, that, that potentially wants to, to come on board and be a second campus of us. And I go, yeah, cool. And uh, so he, he says, listen, this is where we are in the New, new Life in Aurora. And, and, and this church at that time was called Church of New Hope. And, and he said, we want to potentially combine the two and, and you could be the campus pastor over the second campus. And I go, yeah, that's all right. So, so we came, genuinely, Carrie and I came uh, to, he, to the, the, the preliminary meetings to appease our friend, and, and that was it. Like, our intention was to go back to Toledo and be like, yeah, dodge a bullet on that one. <laughs> and we walked through the doors, right? We walked through those doors for the very first time back in 2018, and God just confirmed things in our heart that says, this is where you're supposed to be, and this is what you're gonna do. We're like, oh, <laughs> okay. And fast forward two years. But I think back to that, that original, like even those, those first few weeks uh, here when it was still Church of New Hope and, and we're getting our feet wet and we're, we're figuring out what's going on and we're like, oh man, this is just, we, we see so much potential. And I remembered back, I had a friend when I was in grade school and his dad had not one, but two 1980s DeLoreans. Come on, that's like the cream. Like you could get a Ferrari or you could get two DeLoreans, right? Um, you could probably get like 50 of them, but that's a different story. So, so he had two DeLoreans. Now, I saw with my very own eyes, bo eyes both of them. And I saw like the front bumper because both of them were in a, in a barn with tarps over top of them. And they didn't come out of there. They didn't do anything. They were these two sports cars that are pretty much the greatest sports car of all time. I don't know any other sports car that can travel in time. But these two <laughs> sports cars in the garage covered by tarps. And that was it. They had so much potential, and yet they were covered with tarps. And, and we came here and went, this church has so much that God is going to do I want to just pull the tarp. I just want to be a part of what God is doing. And God has blessed new life so much. And over the last two years, as we, as we look at what God is doing, and as we're pulling the tarp off and taking off, God continues to do more. You know this, over the past two, two years, we have roughly tripled in size. Right? How awesome is that? That God is continuing to to move and bringing new life, not like, ha ha, that's, that's kind of punny, but that's not, like new life to people. God is moving in the church, he's moving in our kids' ministry. When we got here, our kids' ministry was three kids, and two of them I brought with me in my car, <laughs> right? And now we average somewhere around 20 kids every week. You know, God's moving. We can look at, you know, you can look at, right, there, there you go, that's, praise God. We've baptized 17 people. We went from, we went from about 10 life groups. That, there was a current life group that was here that still, still meets. And, and there was, you know, between seven or eight people that were in that life group. You know, to where we right now, we have right around 50 people in life groups. I mean, that's, that's such a fun thing. Now, I could say, we could stand here for the next, like, you know, 30 or 40 minutes and talk about all the fun things that God has done. How God has blessed us and how God has... <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> Listen, I, I don't want to keep it. We have cupcakes ready to go, so we need to make sure we celebrate. But, 
But we now have like, we have things that we're, we have people that are planting roots. We have, we have life change going on here because God is moving. And it's not that we're praying that God does more stuff. We want to be a part of what God continues to do. And we, can, we get to be a part of all that God is doing here and, and seeing our community tr- transformed, seeing our community change, seeing those around us, our neighbors and our friends coming to know Jesus because there is real truth. There is real life. There's real transformation through, through scripture. That's why, that's, truthfully, that's why this is the fa- my favorite part of the week. I actually have two favorite parts, just so you know. This and then Wednesday nights when we, when we walk through and we study through scripture, um, both of them are on the same page. So like that's, that's, those two things are, are what just wind my cranks every week. So um, I think that's a phrase. I don't know. But um, man, man, I, I want to I wanna do that. I also you know, want to say that, that Pastor Stewart sends his greetings. Uh, so... For those of you that don't know, New Life is a part of uh, multiple campuses. So we have two campuses, both Aurora and Stowe. Uh, The Aurora campus uh, pastor, uh, Pastor Stewart, also serves as lead pastor of the whole organization of New Life. So uh, he sends his greetings. He wants to be here, but uh, he also has to preach on Sundays. So um, he he sends his regards and and best wishes to all of us, to to you. And uh, he will be here, I think, in, in like the near future to, to share and preach uh, as well. So uh, I want to jump into scripture today, though. I hope that's, uh, that makes you excited because, because I'm very excited about the parable. We're in this series called Jesus Said. We're in a series called Jesus Said, uh, and we're walking through these different parables that Jesus lays out. Now, parables, when he does this, he's not, you know, we see the parables in scripture, but, but the tendency that Jesus had was he would teach and then he would grab a parable, like he would create a parable. I think he just, I don't think he necessarily came up with them on the spot, but I think by divine wisdom, he's God, so he can, you know, he probably could and that would be fine. But, but he would bring these parables alongside to just help people really grasp what he's trying to teach. And he uses these real life scenarios, these real life stories, and he brings to life what he's teaching. And, and he has, a, you know, what we've been doing is, is just kind of labeling our whole title of the message off of the title of the parable. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna you know, throw caution to the wind today and not, <laughs> right? So the parable we're gonna walk through, Luke, Luke chapter 15, you can turn there. If you have your Bibles or your, your smartphones, you can turn to Luke chapter 15. Uh, we're gonna be there in a moment, but the parable we're gonna walk through uh, in your Bible is probably labeled the parable of the prodigal son. My, my title today you know, this is right, caution to the wind, is the parable of two sons. We're not getting very adventurous, all right, so it's okay. The parable of two sons, because there is, there is in this just as much importance with the older son as there is the younger son. And I, I think as we unpack this, you see some different you know, the different aspects that we can really relate to. So Jesus here, he starts teaching, Luke chapter 15. He starts teaching, uh, and and as he teaches, he starts throwing these parables out one after another. And and this leads to believe that he probably just does all three right in a row, right? There's the parable of the lost sheep, and then there's the parable of the coin. You can go back and read those later. Those are both very short. And then he goes into this lengthier parable, the parable of the prodigal son, that really is one of the coolest short stories of all time. I think that for people that, that don't know the Bible, they don't know Christianity, they don't know anything about what we do, many of them still know the parable of the prodigal son. It's a story that has, has really built out a beautiful understanding of the love of a father and all of these things that we're going to walk through today. But when we look at this story, we look at where, where Jesus is when he's teaching. Right? He starts spending time with sinners and tax collectors. You know, we, we see sinners and tax collectors and we go, oh, okay, bad guys. Like these were, these were the people that were not allowed in church. 
right? They would have gotten kicked out of church. They would have been removed from the church. They weren't welcome in the church. I hope that if a sinner tax collector comes in here, that we welcome them in. A side note, right? That has nothing to do with what we're talking about. But if you kick them out, I'll kick you out. So um, <laughs> I won't, but I'll go get them. But here's the deal. He, these are the people that are not allowed. They are the outcasts. They are the, the downtrodden. They are the, the wretched heathens. So he starts talking with them and he starts hanging out with them. And the, the, the religious people, the, the, the religious leaders and Pharisees, they were, they were the educators. They were disgusted that Jesus would talk to them. So they start grumbling. They start, you know, judging. And, and so his, his crowd here, probably has a little bit of tension involved in it. His crowd probably has, has some, some divisions, right? It's the left side versus the right side here. You, know, you guys can figure out which ones are heathens and which ones are tax collectors, okay? So, so here he has, I was, that was a joke. You guys can all, you can intermingle, it's fine. But, but here we have Jesus with this crowd, this mixed bag going on. And in that, he starts launching into this parable. He starts sharing with them about this father. And he goes, you know what? This father, he has two sons. He has two sons. And the youngest son, he goes to his father and he says, you know what, dad? I don't want to be a part of the family anymore. I don't like what you're doing. I want to go have my own fun. I want to be gone. Please get rid of me from the family. Give me my part of the inheritance so that I may leave. Now in this era, it, it is technically, it's not, it's frowned upon and it's not very welcomed, but it was acceptable for a son to ask for his inheritance before his father died. And it was the father's decision whether or not to, to fulfill that or he could say no, uh, and then the son would just be angry at his dad. So the dad then, the father figure, he fulfills that and he gives his, his youngest son his inheritance and allows his son to go off to a faraway place with his cash money in his pocket and spend it in the clubs, in the bars, wherever he was, right? There is, I mean, most likely he was into some pretty bad stuff. I don't know what, you know, ancient clubs look like. Uh, pretty sure they don't have like, music, but maybe they didn't. I don't know. Um, but here he is and he spends his money and spends his money. He's burned through it. And then all of a sudden in that area then arises a famine. Now a famine was not a result of his bad living. The famine had nothing to do with him. Sometimes we have bad things happen to us because we do dumb things. We make stupid decisions. We make poor investments. We, we, we sin. We fall short of God's glory. And because of that, we're in a bad situation. That happens all the time. Also, there are times that outside of our control, outside of our abilities or our faults, that things happen that are bad. And sometimes when we have dumb decisions layered on top of things out of our control, you get put in really, really bad situations, which is where we find this son. He's in a very low place and he, he finds himself doing illegal things just to survive. Right? He is feeding pigs. Now in that, a, as a Jewish person, you're not allowed to, ba you're basically not allowed to look at pigs let alone touch them, let alone feed them. When, he, when Jesus would have said those words that he found himself in a pig pen feeding the pigs and wishing he could eat what the pigs were eating, ugh. people would have gasped, maybe even gagged at that. Like, that's disgusting. What are you thinking? That's the, this wretchedness of this, this younger son is disgusting. Jesus is painting this picture. 
This is where we, where we pick up today in Luke chapter 15 with this younger son. We're going to read, we're starting in verse 17. Would you stand with me as we kick off? That was a really long introduction. I promise the rest of it will be just as long. So here we, <laughs> here we go. Luke chapter 15. We're going to start in verse 17 today and read the, this kind of open paragraph for us. It says this, but... When he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Let's pray today. Father God, we are no longer worthy to be called your children but yet you have made a way for us. God, I pray today that you help us come home. Be with us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The big question for the day that we're going to wrap around today, this, this forming from, from this parable, what does it take to be a follower of Christ? What does it take to be a follower of Christ? I think there's, there's, as we break down this scripture, there's three levels in this that, that bring us into relationship with the Father. Now this image here, this imaginary Father is also depicted as our Heavenly Father. And if we're the prodigal son, if we're the wayward children, then it's our way to come back to Him. And the first way is come to your senses. It says, but when he came to himself. All right, we look at, we look at a, a, a version of salvation. We look at this image of salvation and we go, oh, to be saved, you pray this prayer and done. You're saved. Okay, now let me break this down. We're going to get into the weeds for a second. There's something called sanctification. That is how, you know, we are now justified toward Christ and be able to walk in eternity with him. Sanctification. Now, sanctification, we believe, though, is not just a moment where you pray a prayer and then you're done. You could sit there. This guy could say, I need to come to my senses. I am now, I want to go back to the Father. Okay, at that moment, he has made a life change. Even though it's just in his heart, he's made a life change. But he cannot stay there. He must make the steps to go back toward his father. That is what we call progressive sanctification. So there's instantaneous sanctification and progressive. So when we pray a prayer, you know, the Bible says, if you confess with your heart, or confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you will be saved. If we pray that, that is a moment but God doesn't want us to sit in a moment. He wants us to walk toward him as he comes toward us. We see this in, in churches all across America where you have somebody that goes, yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, what makes you a Christian? What makes you a follower of Jesus? It's, it's essentially, I'm a Browns fan, right? I, I, am, I am a Browns fan because I like to watch them. That's my team. Right? We see, I hear people say that all the time about different teams. Uh, they go, that's, oh, that's my team. Well, I don't know anybody on the team. I don't ever watch the game. I don't ever go to a game. I don't ever invest into anything. How is that my team and they're just my team? Right? I'm just a Christian. I, I don't invest into any of it. I don't make any effort into it, but I, I'm a Christian. Let's take that a step farther, though, and say, listen, the Browns aren't my team. Until I own 50% of the majority of the team, they're no longer, they're not my team. I don't, that's not mine. I think that there are people that come to church on an off, first service, not you guys, okay? Not anybody watching online. This is all for first service. I just, it's in my notes, so we got to say it here, right? So we have people that go to church and they don't, they're not any more life change than anyone that's on the street every, every Sunday morning. What makes us a Christian is coming to our senses and making that move, right? There's a, there's a commentator that I, I like to follow, and, and he was writing about this, and, and this just kind of rocked my, my socks here for a second. 
When he says that, it says this about when he came to himself, he says in, in his clear thinking, he didn't think how to improve the conditions of the pig pen. He didn't blame his father. He didn't blame his brother or his friends or boss or pigs. He recognized the misery without focusing on it and instead focused on the father. That's life change. That's what it means to come to our senses. And many of us, you know, if, if you've been in church for a long time, maybe you have come to your senses. That's great. That's awesome. We can continue to do that and continue to walk knowing that, you know, we may be a few steps closer, but we still have a long way to go. And that's okay. Because, because it brings us to the next part of this, that it's not just about him being in the pig pen, but now he makes that journey. And we remember, second thing is we remember God already loves us. I think this is a big one to hang on for a second. Right, he arose, right, verse 20, he arose and came to his father. But while he was a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. That embraced and kissed, right, that is in the, in the Greek, that is a, that's not just a, a, a smooch on the cheek. That's not just one kiss. It says that he emphatically kissed him, like he repeatedly, over and over. He was so happy that he was there, he kept kissing him. And the son said to his father, right, this is, this is the, dad, I, I messed up. You ever, you ever have, as a kid, you know, you ever have those moments where you're like pacing in your room, you're like, dad, I'm sorry, I did this and I did this. I, I pray that, you know, I'm sorry that I did this and I will start to, you know, I, I will change my ways. I will, I will clean my room and I will clean the garage and I will wash your car and, and I'm sorry, just don't, you know, hit, this is his speech. He's, he's getting a speech, father, I have sinned against heaven and, and before you. Forgive me. I don't even, don't even make me like one of your kids. Make me like a hired servant. Right? He's, he's repeating this over and over and over. From a long way off, the father sees him. And the father ran. Now this is a, this is a unique little detail that, that Jesus puts into this. Right? This image of, of the father running because grown men don't run. Can I get an amen, right? <laughs> the irony of this, right, I was listening to a podcast this, this, this week, earlier this week, it, uh, you know, kind of just wrapping my head around it, and I like to do some research, and as I'm listening to a podcast, I was running, and they were talking about how grown men don't run. I'm like, oh, this is awkward, right? <laughs> so ancient, ancient Israel, even cultures today, there are still cultures today that, that grown men, it is, it's not only hard, right? So, so you figure you're painting a picture of a guy like late 40s, early 50s, who has walked for say 40 to 30, 30 to 40 years. He has not ran a single step, now takes off running. That's a difficult thing to do. You have a guy in sandals and a tunic you know, he, hasn't, he doesn't have running shoes. He doesn't have good athletic sneakers or shorts to run, right? He is, he is probably very difficult for him, let alone unbelievably undignified. This is a bad thing for him to run. How disgraceful is that? This is shameful. And yet he ran. You know, he ran, I, I, you know, you paint this picture as a loving father longing for his child to come back. And I think that there's several that maybe you have a broken relationship that you can relate to that, that you go, I watched them walk out that door and I will stare at that door every day until they come back. And you long for that. Maybe they drove off. And you long for the day when they, you can be reunited with your kid, with that loved one, with that relationship. And you go, I wish, I wish that they could just see them come through that door again. And you see this emotion in the father that longs for, for his kid to come back. And he gets to this point where he, he looks, and he looks, I, I think, I think, and he takes off running. 
What joy, what emotion falls over. And you can almost imagine people in the crowd at that time to have a wayward kid, somebody that had abandoned their family that just completely cut them out. That is like, that's me. That's me, that was me. I'm that guy, I'm that father, I'm that child, I need to go back. But there's also, there's also history in that. Uh, many of the conservative, like the, the strict conservative communities in Jesus' era. If a child does this, it's not that they're no longer welcome, it's not that they just abandon their family, it's they're cut out of the whole community. So if you could imagine if a kid is, is cut out of the whole community, that the father staying on the side of the community, looking out, seeing his son, saying, I have to get to that son first because if I get to him first, I can claim him and bring him back. But if somebody else gets there first, he's no longer welcome. He's cut out. He'll be lost forever. So you have a dad that runs, he races to his son so that he can get there before anybody else because if he gets there, then his son will be found. His dead son is now alive. You can look at any of these ways. Either one, build on top of each other. The most important thing, the reason why the father ran is because he loves his kids. And we have a heavenly father. We have a God of the universe that loves us, that he painted this picture so that we may know that he loves us. And not only that, he loves us before we love him. Right, 1 John 4, 19 says, we love because he first loved us. Right, Romans 5, 8. For God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Right, Ephesians 2, 4. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love, which, is, which he loved, uh, which, with which, there we go, we'll get it here eventually. With which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses made us alive in Christ. He didn't wait. The father didn't wait for us. He didn't wait for, for, for the, the son to get to him. He ran to him. That image is so powerful. But Jesus keeps going in the story. Because the, the son says, Father, listen, Father, I've, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I've sinned against you. I'm so sorry. And it's almost like the, the father goes, Sh shut up a second. Just quiet. Don't talk. And he turns to his servant. He says, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And this son of mine, or, and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Let us, and they began to celebrate. They began to celebrate. Now this is an unexpected, right? The son that is here, he's not trying to get back into the family. Right, this son is not, he is coming to his father as a businessman, right? He says to him that he wants to be a hired servant. Where does that fall, right? You have, you have, the, the father, the patriarch of the family, and then you have the offspring, and then you have kids, right? The kids would be, children would be the lowest per point of the family. But below the kids, still included in that family, that household is slaves. So you have slaves that are there that are a part of the family. So when a father were to die, that part of the inheritance was to take care of the slaves that they were a part of their family still. But then below that were the hired servants. They're not a part of the family. If something happens to the father, they're, they're gone. They're just day laborers. They're just there to get, you know, earn some money and then they're gone. They, there's no tie between the, the day laborers, the hired servants and the family. The son comes and says, dad, don't make me a part of the family. Just make me a hired servant. And the father says, shut up a second. You don't know what you're asking. You're a part of this family. Come in. But he goes, there's a third one. 
right? We know that, that we have to come to our senses. We remember that God loves us first. But then there's this third pitch. We need an older brother. For some of you that have read this story before, you go, huh? You know, this is the older brother. Enter the, the, the older son. It says now his older son was in the field. Almost, you almost forget about the older son. Before this point, he goes, Jesus says the very beginning, he says the guy has two sons. And then he turns and talks about just the younger son. And then all of a sudden, the, the younger son comes back and everybody's like, yay, that's great. And then he says now his older son was in a field. And as he drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked one uh, about these, the, what, things, what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to come in. Now you look at that and you go, wait a second, why do I need a judgmental older brother? I already have one of those, right? What do we need here? Now we look at this. Let's look at this from two perspectives for a second. One, this is for the religious leaders. As a religious leader, we'll get into this in a second, that, that Jesus looks at it. And oftentimes we look at this and we go, the scornful older brother is so rotten. How un unthankful that guy is. Let me pitch to, pitch to you something. The younger son says, divide out the inheritance so that I might take mine. So if the father takes the inheritance, since there's two sons, the older son gets a double portion, right? That's, that's common in history. So, so if you have a million dollars, we're gonna do this for sake of, you have $999,999. Divide that by three. The younger son gets $333,333. That money is his. He takes that and goes and burns through all of it. The father is left with $660,666. That is the inheritance of the older brother. That fatted calf falls somewhere in line about here not here. So who pays for the celebration of bringing the younger son back? It's the older brother. Now in that image, we need an older brother, AKA Jesus to come in and pay for us to be a part of his family. Jesus pays the, pe the penalty. He pays the way so that we may have eternal life, come back to the father. That is an unbelievable image to go, okay, this is, what, this is what God is talking about. That we need an older brother. We need Jesus because without him, we're lost in a pig pen. We need that older brother. He's the one that pays the way. But this older brother, we need an older brother, not this one, because this one's a bum. Right? What does he do? He turns and says, I'm not going in there. That scoundrel swindled my dad out of a third of his estate, and then he's going to come back? I'm going to punch him. I want to fight that guy. I'm not going to eat a, a fatted calf with him. And he just stays outside and kind of sulks on his own. And we pick it up in the story. It says, his father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, I think he gets a little, I, this is my, my imagination, all right? I think this is how he talks to his dad. And I think his dad ought to punch him for this. But we're violent today. My goodness. He should just scold him, right? He should sternly look at him. Look, these many years I have served you and I have never disobeyed your commandment, yet you have never given, you've never gave me a young goat. You've never given me anything. I didn't even get a goat. 
Goats are awful. I don't know why you want to go. Anyway, he says that, that I might celebrate with my friends, but this son of yours came in who has devoured your property with prostitutes. You killed the fatted calf for him. That's passion. There, there's some aggression here. He's angry. He's disappointed. He's, he's selfish. It's not his. It's his dad's. Dad can do whatever he wants. He's mad that his dad gave away a third of his estate to his brother. And then he has the audacity. And the father looks at him and says to his son, son, you are always with me. All that, I, that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this, this your brother was dead. See, he, turn, he turns it, right? He says, this, the brother, the older son says, your son, and the dad goes, your brother, your brother was dead and is alive. Jesus turns to the Pharisees, to the religious leaders that are scornful of all of the heathens and, that are, and sinners that are around, and he says to them, he says, these guys, they're in the kingdom too. They're your brothers. They're a part of this. Anybody can come. Anybody can be a part of the kingdom of God. Anybody is welcome because I have made the way. You don't get to pick. That's my job. He was lost and is found. I would imagine that this son the older son caused the same amount of pain in his judgment of his younger brother as the younger brother did leaving. And when we look at this image and we go, God, help us. I don't know where each one of us, where we are today. I don't know whether or not, you know, you are still in the pig pen Maybe you're still partying, right? Our life is still, it's still flying high, living on the inheritance. Maybe we're on our way back. That journey back. That we can see the love of Jesus running toward us. Running toward us. Maybe we're where the older brother is. You're the older brother in this image is separated from the father. He does everything right. He's a part of the, the, the house. He's a part of what's going on. He's a part of, of the inheritance, but he's separated from the father because he won't go in. The end of the story ends with the younger brother in relationship with the father and the older brother out. I wonder today if we could do a couple things. Seth, if you want to come. I want us to just spend some time. Seth, they're, they're going to play a song and we're going to pray here in a moment. I want this to be a very personal time for you because I can ask the question, where are you? And you can, every one of us can answer that question. We know where we're at. And we know how to get to where we need to be. And it's a matter of just making that decision to come to our senses and go, God, you've loved me first. Help me love you. Salvation, this relationship with God, is the way we get from where we are on earth into heaven, into a relationship with Christ. That's salvation. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, it's a two-step process. Here, he, oh, it's here and here, not here and here, here and here. That's it. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you'll be saved. That means you, you on your own, you go, hey, God, help me. Help me. Bring me to the Father. Maybe we've been separated for other reasons. 
What is it for you to come back to the Father today? Maybe you're with the Father. Today then is a day of celebration. And I think that is a, a perfectly acceptable thing to do today that we celebrate all that God is doing and how God is, is changing and transforming others and how he, he continues to transform us. Right, the Bible says be transformed. It's not a one-time thing. It is a continual transformation by the renewing of your mind. Right, be transformed. We can celebrate that today. We're gonna sing a, a, a new song today and I would love it. Would you all stand with me this, this morning? I want us to, in the reflection of this song, to just answer that question, where are you? Let's pray today. Father God, I pray that you would help us, help us to be with you. Lord, we have sinned against heaven and against you, and we pray that you forgive us. We pray that we could come back to you we pray that we can be a part of what you're doing. God, I pray today that you would speak to each one in this room right now. Speak to those watching online. Lord, I pray that, that you would help us answer the question, where are we right now? And not just sit in that answer, but, but continue to walk back to the presence of the Father. Help us today in the name of Jesus. the first. 
times of or response times of second service I often sneak out and and just go check on the kids and and I had this moment listening to this song while I'm peeking in on some of you some of your kids as they're in class and they're they're learning about Jesus but I, I just have this impression that if you have kids if you are a mom or a dad you have kids under your care, I want to pray a special blessing on you today because this this is such an important part of of what we do. Now, if if your kids are grown, I'm going to pray a blessing over you as well. And if you don't have kids, I'm going to pray a blessing over you as well. But hang on, hang with me for a minute because, because the image of a father waiting on his child That same image is Jesus waiting on us. And I find such honor and privilege and and then again, overwhelming like humility that, that God has entrusted new life with some of your children. 
And I pray that we as a community, as a body, inspire and encourage your kids to follow Christ, not just in their life, but, but in, as, as called members of this, the community in the body of Jesus, that they go on and do greater things than we do. We have such an opportunity, and I'm so, honestly, I, I just, I'm so honored and humbled that we get to be a part of that. But it starts with you. Man, I think, I think we have some of the greatest parents in all of the community. All of, all of the world that are in, that's just me. I, I, and I don't say that to be like, oh, look at you. I believe that. That God is using parents. And I wanna pray a blessing over you today. Would you pray with me as we close out? Father God, I pray. I pray a blessing over every mom and dad right now of the, of the early childhood, all, those, all the young students, all the young kids in, those, in the early childhood right now. Father, I pray a supernatural patience. I pray wisdom. I pray just a, a power to love those babies. Love those children in incredible ways. Father, I pray a blessing over those who have kids that are in elementary. God, I pray that you would use them to inspire and educate and train their kids in the ways of the Lord so that when they are older, they won't depart. God, I pray a blessing over parents of teenagers today that they would use those, those last moments that they kind of have for the last years in their house, that you would use this time to bind relationship with, with young adults. God, I pray that you would bless them. Father, for those that have kids out of the house, parents of of. of adults. God, I pray a blessing that they would be able to speak, that they would be able to share, that they would be able to, to use even this time with them. Father, I pray for those that aren't yet or aren't ever parents. God, I pray a blessing that they become spiritual aunts and uncles, mothers and fathers, that they would be able to lead and grow the community of Christ. Father, I pray a blessing over everyone that's a part of new life everyone in this room, everybody watching online, that you would, you would not just let this be a time here, that it's not just about a Sunday morning, but it's about taking your gospel to the world. It's about living out our life. Father, I pray that you send us out with the power of the Holy Spirit and the favor of the Lord today. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us today. We have cupcakes outside those doors. Would love for you to just hang out, have a, have a cupcake, have some fun, and we'll hang out. If you're watching online, if you could be here in 15, you can get a cupcake too.